This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hello, and welcome to the Monday morning break. My name is Kandu Kutik, and my special guest today is Nigel Kaplan. I'll be talking with Nigel about the five paragraph essay and how we can move away from teaching a one size fits all format of writing. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Hello. And this show well. is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use the code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. Hello and welcome to the show. It is really great to have you, our listeners, with us as we discuss the five-paragraph essay, the essay that so many of us have taught in our writing curriculum. We have Nigel Kaplan with us, joining us from Delaware, who's going to share with us where this format came from, why so many of us teach it, and why we actually need to move beyond the five-paragraph essay. And Nigel, I think you're in the show. Say hello. Morning. Good morning, Nigel. So let me properly welcome you to the show. Yes, <laughs> it worked. How are you this morning? You sound I'm, so chirpy. I'm very well. It's it's it's. I would say it's bright and early, but it's so early here in Delaware, it's not even bright. It's still dark. <laughs> oh, what time is it where you are? Oh, it's just it's just past seven in the morning. So um, I uh, hope I am uh, somewhat lucid for your listeners today. You're lucid so far and you made it in. So welcome, welcome. Nigel, let's talk about this five paragraph essay. I have to admit, I'm really excited about this because I've been teaching it for so long. I've stopped teaching it now. Um, and um, I, when I used to teach it, I used to think this is just not appropriate. So over to you, Nigel, tell, tell us please, where, how did it get into our curriculum? That, that's a really good question. So I, I don't know how it got into your curriculum um, in Germany or around the world, honestly. Um, but I can tell you that it, it does appear to have originated um, in the United States. It, it's probably not one of our better exports. Um, it seems to have originated in the, the, the late 50s and into the 60s um, as a way of responding to a perceived crisis in education, particularly in higher education. And it, you know, we've, we've had this over the years, right? It's the old uh, um, myth that, you know, Johnny can't write and mm -hmm. therefore we have to do something about it, right? So yeah. it, it, it seems to emerge, you know, here in the US, we've had this tradition of teaching so-called composition classes. So most universities, you take a one semester or two semester writing class, which has had different names over the years. We call it first year composition. Um, it, the older name for it was um, freshman writing or first year writing. Um, it seems to have come out of this tradition, uh, maybe out of high schools um, as well. And it, it, it seems to emerge from this uh, feeling that students um, writing is uh, disorganized, um, incomprehensible, um, and it's curious because it tended to pop up right around the time that access to higher education was being expanded. In other words, you had students coming in 
who well, you had more students, you had students with different types of preparation, broader and, and maybe uh, traditionally less you know, well prepared, however we understand that. And the response was to, instead of to sort of meet the students where they are and help them develop as writers, the, the response was to impose this form, this formula, to try to make writing, um, I guess, easy or uh, manageable. Uh, which is mm -hmm. what I, I think, I, I think it, that is something that it does. Um, I don't know whether it does that well, but um, it definitely does it. So I, it, it's interesting you said that, you know, you have taught it for years and years. And I think many people feel that, oh, we must have always done this. Um, but we actually haven't. It's, it's been around for about 50, 60 years. Um, and um, it is not the only way writing has been taught. Um, it, there are, you know, many ways um, into it. It was actually uh, one of the things I found out was that it was it was quote unquote discovered uh, twice, seven years apart, in the same academic journal. Uh, so clearly, oh. the first article didn't uh, didn't make much of an impact. <laughs> but it, it it gets spread and it gets spread through uh, mandated curricula. I think you mentioned standardized testing. That's mm -hmm. a sort of uh, I think a myth that that where that comes from. Um, and it, it sort of gets um, turned into something that is is a package that can be delivered and it becomes very attractive. I think it comes into second language writing, which is my field uh, and yours as well, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, for similar reasons, it, it's somewhat later and it gets interestingly sort of bound up in in what was never really the process movement so we never truly had a process writing movement in uh, the second in second language writing and what we ended up with as, as one scholar said is a process to write a five paragraph essay which <laughs> isn't really much of a writing process um, but it is something that has been perceived as uh, as i said manageable and navigable and teachable convenient and exactly yeah, there's a convenience to it because you don't have to think very much. Um, yeah. And that's not a, I don't mean that to be dismissive, but it, it is, I think maybe it, it comes off that way, but it, it really does take the thinking out of writing. And the thinking is what makes writing hard. Um, and, but I, I do think it comes from a, a genuine um, effort to deal with the perception that my students can't write in the ways I want them to. And it is, I, I think, intended to be something that you can give students and that will be a, you know, the best defense of it is that it is a starting point. My concern is that it is nearly always the finish line, not the starting mm -hmm. point. And that's why, yep. you know, I, I've, I've rejected it, you know, for, for many years and I, I go around, you know, continuing to rant about it to the extent yep. people still listen. <laughs> I mean, it's a flawed formula, isn't it? Because, um, for instance, I have teachers who have argued in favor of the five paragraph essay who say, well, once the students learn this formula, of you know what goes in an introduction concepts but you know you have a hook you elaborate you use the funnel introduction right and you start really broad and you narrow it down and then you have your your thesis statement at the end of that first paragraph and then each subsequent paragraph your three body paragraphs you start with a topic sentence and then you finish you know your concluding paragraph with with a, con a concluding signal like all in all, or to sum up, and mm -hmm. then you rephrase your thesis statement, you summarize your main points, and then you leave a message to the reader, and you have teachers who teach that who say, well, once they can do that, once they've mastered this formula, they can um, adopt it to any kind of, of academic writing they do that's not five paragraphs. And, and I find that um, very simplified. I find that really, really simplistic because um, it's it's not the case. It, it it takes the creativity out of it. It 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 forces students to think. Well, I can only have three supporting ideas. Yes. Yes. Heaven forbid you have four, right? Oh, good. No, no, no. <laughs> and heaven forbid you, you don't have a final message to the to the reader at the end. 
Oh, right. how could you? How could you write something like I, that? I, I know, I know. Uh, it, it's it's kind of amazing. I mean, I think um, you know, you, you've you've hit on you know uh, many of the the challenges, and it's you know it's. If you, so I'll, I'll start with the biggest problem with it, which uh, your readers, your listeners may well have sort of got as you went through. Is it's boring? I mean, no, you know, it, it. This is not writing anyone wants to read, right? I mean, I don't know yeah. how many of of how many of the listeners or you know, teaching colleagues sort of sit down with great enthusiasm to a stack of five paragraph essays and and really desperately want to see what your students. Uh, have said that's not why you you do it you you look at it and you sort of check things off and either they did or they didn't you know meet all those criteria that you you you, you listed for, for so well there and we can all recite them right the, that's oh yeah it's very funny to me um that we we you know we live in completely different countries we've never actually met in person except online um <laughs> and we we teach in completely different contexts and yet both of us can rattle off the criteria of a <laughs> yeah. paragraph essay almost word for word i would have described it essentially exactly the same way um it, it's it's curious that it's become this universal form even though that's not the kind of writing i think that is prized in either of our cultures right yeah um so the the thing about the there's two issues there i think to to get into um one is this idea that you can well there's three maybe one is the idea that you can write the same way for everything which mm -hmm. is a really strange concept. Um, so, uh, you know, and maybe uh, the other is this transfer issue, but I, I think they're related. And then the third is sort of, well, what do we actually mean by the five paragraph essay? And it's got nothing to do with the number of paragraphs and this sort of thing. But, but let's just sort of get at the essence of it. So the, the essence of it is this idea that you can write in general, right? Um, yeah. Elizabeth Wardle, who's a, a wonderful uh, scholar uh, here in the U.S. in the uh, in rhetoric and composition, um, uh, has a chapter uh, in a, a little online book called uh, Bad Ideas About Writing. Uh, it's a free online book. You can look it up. And she says there is no such thing as writing in general. Writing mm -hmm. is always in particular. And I love that line. And I quote it all the time because that really gets to the heart of the problem. Um, this idea that you can learn to write in general and it will sort of magically transfer to other um, domains. Yeah. Um, and as you said, that's not what students actually do. I mean, for a start, transfer is really hard, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, teaching to, to, if you want transfer to happen, you have to directly teach for it. I think we know that. We don't, mm -hmm. we can't just assume it'll happen, but I think very often we say, oh, do this now, and then when you go to the next thing, whether that's to the university or to another class or into a profession, then you'll do, you know, real writing, this other kind of writing that I'm withholding from you. It's a strange, strange approach. It's like an initiation. It's yeah, like an right. initiation. Like you have to learn this first, and once you've learned this, yes, then we'll let you write. Then we'll let you do real writing. And my argument has always been: okay, even if you could demonstrate the transfer, and nobody has ever demonstrated this to me beyond, you know, uh, very sort of occasional anecdotes. But even if you could demonstrate that this transfer happens, I do not believe it happens for everyone. And that worries me because my yeah. job is to teach all my students, not just the handful who already know how to write, which is what that really means, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it also sort of worries me because like, well, rather than say, we'll give you this thing which nobody wants to read or write, and then in the future you'll do proper writing, why not just have them do proper writing now? Um, and it, it sounds a little, I'm not trying to trivialize it because it's a really, really serious question because to me, the act of writing should always be an act of creating meaning. Yeah. Um, right. Because if not, why bother? And I don't, and I, I think that's important because a lot of students don't bother with writing and they find ways to avoid it and they engage in practices that we don't want them to, and there are increasing ways 
of not doing the writing, right? Let's be honest. But if yeah. students have no reason to write, they have no motivation to write, they're not creating any meaning, they're just producing this form, you know, as a formula, like painting by numbers, why would they do it? Why would they engage with it? Um, do we, is it any surprise that the results are boring and banal and trivial in, in what students write? Well, no, because they are picking up on the message we are sending, which is, we don't care what you write as long as it fits this form. That's a really negative message, I think, to send. Um, and it, it's not something I particularly want to engage in uh, as a teacher. Mm. Mm. I mean, the, the writing, it, it's not meaningful at all. You, you know, I mean, I see it. I see it in my students, <laughs> in my students' eyes. When I teach my writing class, they don't do it in their first semester. They do it in their second or in their third semester of study, uh -huh. um, by which time they would have already had um, subject modules where, you know, they'd have to write term papers at the end of it. And, and in Germany, we don't, we don't set um, a word count as a limit, but rather pages. So mm -hmm. students be told you need to write a 10 page or a 15 page essay on such and such a topic. And if in our writing class, all we're doing is the five paragraph essay, and then I say to them, well, you know, if, if you learn all the skills here, you, you can transfer some of that to your term paper. They're looking at me going, I'm sure that they're thinking their heads, well, if my p five paragraph essay is one A4 page, how many paragraphs would I need for my, you know, 10 page term paper? And, and, and I can tell as a teacher, I can, t I, I know that this is flawed because um, I know that an introduction to a term paper goes beyond one paragraph. And I know your conclusion doesn't always need to have a message to the reader and, <laughs> Um, depending on, on which course book you use, um, that there were the ones um, that had come out in the early 2000s, late 90s, where there was nothing about synthesizing information, paraphrasing, mm -hmm. using sources. So if, if I'm doing that and if I'm really sticking, I have a colleague who, who does say, well, in, in our essay writing class, we teach the TOEFL essay, which is essentially, you know, the five paragraph essay. Um, I'm just thinking to myself, well, that's even worse for them because we're, it's not meaningful. We're asking them things like, um, if, if I, you know, what's better? Is it better to live in a small town or um, a village? Or is it better to study at a big university or a small university? And, you know, on the one hand, it's easy. Students do well because maybe they have something to say about it. But at the end of the course, they go away and I think they take very little from it. Well, because it's and, not and meaningful. It's not meaningful, and who cares? And it, it, as well, when you're asking that question, you don't really care if the student would rather live in a large town or a small village, right? The, the purpose of the prompt, the prompt is a pretext for generating mm. language, right? And you can see why they do it. On, and the, the TOEFL's independent writing task has always sort of lent itself to this. Although to ETS's credit, nowhere do they say you have to write a five paragraph essay. And yet um, we teach it because it's easy. We teach it because it's easy. And, and honestly, if you've only got, how long do they give you? 30 minutes, 20, 30, 30 minutes, minutes yeah. That? Yeah, I mean, realistically, well, if you can get five paragraphs out in that time, you're going quite well. But realistically, that's about all you can do in that time, right? Yeah, um, but I, I think it's really important not to confuse the the TOEFL essay with writing. Um, that it's not that's not really what it is, right? So those mm -hmm. topics which are almost comically um, banal um, are there because they are the test is taken by students around the world, and the uh, you know the the. the um, uh, the, the, the people who write it are looking for topics that, you know, will be, I guess, generic in the sense of things that anyone can approach. Um, and it's trying to deny the every one thing we know about writing, by the way, is there is always a an effect of topic, right? Um, yeah. you, you write about things that you know about better than things you don't. I mean, that should be obvious. 
Um, and so they can't really ask interesting questions because mm -hmm. half the test takers wouldn't have a clue how to respond to it. And even if they did, they wouldn't be able to do it in 30 minutes. So the purpose, I think it's really important when people are saying, OK, I teach the quote unquote TOEFL essay. First of all, there is no such thing as the TOEFL essay. Uh, that's something we have developed as an infrastructure around the test. There's no evidence mm -hmm. that that's what they are looking for. You look at the rubric, it's not that clear. Yeah. Um, it's actually somewhat more flexible than I think people realize. Not vastly, it is still a, a standardized test. But the, the purpose of that test isn't really to test whether people can develop ideas. It's not um, to see whether you can marshal sources into an original cogent argument. It's a language proficiency test. It's designed to elicit certain types of language so that it can be evaluated and used to determine the student's proficiency or readiness or capacity to do something else, right? Mm. Nobody cares what you write on the test. It's not even clear whether humans read it. It's, it's likely read in by, by, it's read at least by one human. Uh, I know that other tests um, from the same uh, company are, are, are marked, have been marked by, uh, have been marked automatically for a long, long time. This has nothing to do with the latest hype. Uh, this okay. is a, an old thing. Yeah, this has been around for decades. And that's fine that it, 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 because it's, it doesn't matter what you say, right? And that's right. the evidence that shows you it doesn't matter what you say because it's being uh, evaluated by a system that is incapable of knowing what you said. That's not yep. the point. The point is, did you follow, did, do you have something that appears like structure, has the surface features of cohesion and coherence? Not whether mm -hmm. it is truly cohesive and coherent, because that's something that is much more complex, but does it look like it? And what kind of language did you use? So ultimately, it is a, it, it, it's really a vocabulary and grammar test, yep. which, let's face it, is what we Actually, what customers, and let's be clear that with tests like that, we are talking about customers, that's what it is needed for. Um, you know, so when, when a student submits a TOEFL score, I, I, I evaluate applications for our master's degree. I, I'm not looking at the writing score thinking, oh, well, this means the student will be able to write uh, excellent uh, papers in um, applied linguistics or wonderful lesson plans that will uh, be deeply reflective of their experiences, because obviously the test can't tell me that. Uh, it's telling me at minimum or at maximum, I think, something about the student's um, ability to produce certain types of language with certain levels of accuracy in a timed context. That's all. Yeah. So if that's what you're teaching, the signal you're sending to students is that's what I care about, yep, not yep. what you say, not your development, not your ideas, not use of sources. I care about formal structure and grammatical complexity and accuracy. Yeah, That's so how you put words into sentences and sentences into paragraphs and, and paragraphs into essay, really. Yeah. It's proficiency. Yeah. You're, you're just testing what they can or cannot do, but you're not. It's not an assessment. I would say well, it's it's an assessment of something, but I, I think that um, you know I, I think one of my concerns is that writing has got too bound up with assessment, um, and we are um, teaching writing for the purposes of assessment, and that mm -hmm. students are generating writing for a grade or a mark or a number or a letter or a yeah. level, whatever it is. And that is the most artificial form of writing. So as soon as you put this sort of, you know, industrial grading complex on top of writing, I think that's one reason you get the five paragraph essay. And again, I'm not saying this to criticize the teachers who are teaching it, who are often doing so, I think, with the best of intentions and sometimes with very little choice and autonomy uh, yeah. in the matter. Uh, partly, you mentioned the textbooks. I do think that uh, textbooks have been responsible for this. Um, partly because I think there is pressure from um, 
uh, curriculum designers, from supervisors, uh, from students even. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I, I think it is, again, this is often a, uh, a decision that is out of the teacher's hands. But if we can disentangle the teaching of writing from the assessment of language, um, I think we'll get a lot closer if our goal is truly to teach students to write. And I think that's worth asking, right? Is that yeah. what we're actually trying to do? Because if we are, we can't do this five paragraph essay stuff. But if all we're doing is using writing as a pretext for generating and assessing language, okay, we, you, you can use anything for that, right? Mm. Mm. And and I mean, I I personally also believe that you can't teach writing necessarily in a 10, 12 or 15 week semester. It's something that, that you have to keep going back to so you can teach it in a writing course, Composition 101 or, you know, freshman writing course. Um, but then when the students leave you and they go on to their subjects, they go on to other courses, um, it needs to be revisited. And unfortunately, um, not everywhere, not all institutions, whether, you know, it's in secondary school for students doing A-levels or high school leaving exams or at university, it's not addressed again. So I have students who come to me at some point and say, well, I really don't know how to, to write a BA thesis, right? And yeah. and. and to be told by other colleagues, well, you've learned how to do the five paragraph essay. Surely you can expand on that. Or I have colleagues who, 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 who look at their writing grades. Um, I've given up. I do not. I no longer give grades for writing mm -hmm. um, in my writing class um, because colleagues have said, well, or students say, well, I've got this grade. It's a good grade. And why did I fail, you know, my final essay in in my other module? So what I'd like to do um, next, um, after I play the messages and the news, Nigel, is I'd like to come to something that I've actually learned from you um, in, you know, in teaching writing, that we look at purpose, audience, context, and, and structure. So let me play the messages and the news first, and then we'll go on to talking about that. Be right back. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use the code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. This week in the news, is World Book Day a burden on parents? Has the tide turned against hyper-discipline in schools? Is Scotland going to be excluding more students? Should we be talking up the benefits of going to school at a school that is turning the clock back on mobile phones? World Book Day on March the 7th has become a fixture in the school calendar, where pupils are encouraged to come to school dressed as their favourite characters, or bring books to donate or tell their friends about. This celebration of reading, though, has become a little controversial, as reported in the BBC and The Guardian. Parents have complained of increasing pressure to buy commercialised costumes or spend time and money elaborately creating their own. Some of the pressure has a class element, with some parents sending their children to school dressed as characters from Harry Potter, while others might be the artful dodger. Head teacher Fran Davis from Michigan Primary School in Mountain Ash has said she wants the day to be fun without being a financial burden. Therefore, she suggests, that pupils can come in their pyjamas, suggesting their favourite bedtime book, or simply in school uniform, as they might be pupils at Hogwarts or even Greyfriars. If you wish to hear teachers' views on World Book Day, listen to last week's Late Show with Lucy Newberger on Teachers Talk Radio. One of the most significant developments in education in the last few decades 
has been the trend towards positive discipline or military style discipline in schools. And this provides the context for the next two stories this week. The first story appeared on the BBC and was covered by the Guardian newspaper. And it's about the Michaela School, led by the controversial head teacher, sometimes described as Britain's strictest head teacher, Catherine Burgle Singh, who has been in the news for the school's policy towards Muslim prayers. Half of the pupils of the school are Muslim students. Two students have given interviews where they describe a toxic atmosphere of the school and an atmosphere of fear and being stripped of their identity. If you wish to learn more of this story, you can find Tom Rogers' interview with Catherine Burble Singh on this topic on Teachers Talk Radio. The increasing prevalence of tiger-style teaching, strict discipline methods, zero tolerance and first-time-every-time expectations of students across British schools was highlighted when a parent at Boston Spa Academy complained her autistic son found school intolerable as over a period of only a few days he acquired 56 negative comments and several days in isolation. Boston Spa Academy schools have appeared frequently in Education Uncovered and other news outlets for their strict approach involving lining up for inspections and an expectation that rules will be obeyed instantly and at all times. Not for the first time, teachers' unions have described these policies as inhumane. This week, Scotland's Education Secretary, Jenny Gilruth, announced that there would be a review of Scottish Government's policy on exclusions. The number of exclusions from schools has dropped considerably in recent years as a determined policy of avoiding school exclusion was adopted following research of a link between excluded students and later involvement in crime. However, with one third of teachers in Scotland reporting in a survey of the EIS union that they had suffered assault or physical violence in the previous year, pressure to review the non-exclusion policy has resulted in a reconsideration. School attendance is once again in the news. A survey revealed that nearly a third, 32% of teachers and school leaders have experienced pupils being absent this academic year because of a parental dispute with the school. The survey by Teacher Tap asked 8,411 teachers and leaders in state schools in England in January what reasons they had been given for pupils missing school this academic year, other than illness. More than half, 51%, said pupils had been kept home because they were tired after an event the night before. Nearly 9 out of 10, 87%, said that wanting to take a holiday during term time was the reason, while more than three in four, 76%, pointed to family events. John Camp, president of the Association of School and College Leaders, warned in a speech to the union's annual conference that the unwritten social contract between families and schools is fracturing, and he called for a change of tone in the national conversation about education to ensure that people talk up schools and colleges. And finally, another story from the BBC, where Milldown Academy in Blandford Forum head teacher Mr Law has adopted the policy of providing brick phones, old-fashioned simple mobile phones for students. Parents can hire or borrow them as an alternative to smartphones, which are increasingly distracting in the school. You can find more discussion of these and other stories on Teachers Talk Radio or reviewed each Sunday on Teachers Talk Radio panel which you can find the links to on YouTube or the Teachers Talk Radio site. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with John Gibbs. So, welcome back. You're listening to the Monday Morning Break on Teachers Talk Radio. And with us today, we have Nigel Kaplan. We were just talking about the five-paragraph essay. And we. I'd like to move on to how we can change our practice and as i was saying before the messages nigel i um learned from you um and i am trying to change my practice i start my writing class with a discussion about purpose of writing and you know my students actually um really like that because it just makes the class more meaningful you know we're not just going in dull like okay Let's have a 10-minute discussion on 
you know, if you'd like to meet somebody from the past, who would you like to meet? Um, we start with purpose. Do you think that is a good starting point? Yeah, well, uh, I, purpose is everything, right? I mean, purpose yeah. is your motivation as a writer, and it allows you to, to sort of um, bring in right from the, the outset that the reason for writing and the reason for reading, um, because the vast majority of things uh, we write are designed for someone else to read. So, you know, with the possible exception of, say, you know, personal diary writing. And even that, I think, often has a an imagined audience, right? Um, yeah. You know, m most writing is done, um, I, I say, you know, we write for some, we write something for someone in a particular situation, right? We don't yeah. just write. So I'm, I'm fond mm. of saying writing is a transitive verb, right? You have to write something. Uh, you, most people don't just sit down and generate uh, writing, although there's there's value to doing that, um, I think as well. That's not what we're usually seeing in in writing uh, classes. So I I think purpose is very important. So the the way um, and what this gets us to is the sort of antidote uh, to the five paragraph essay, which many many other people have talked about over the years, and I've certainly tried to as well, which is teaching writing through the idea of genre. Um, genre meaning not, you know, poetry, prose and, and drama, but genre meaning that the type of writing, the, yeah. the ways that certain kinds of texts perform certain functions in a given cultural context. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a very different way of looking at writing than, you know, let, let's find a way to, you know, elicit the past simple tense. Um, so, um, and genre requires us to think about purpose, yes, about context, what comes before, what comes after, what is going on around the writing, about the role of the, about the reader, right? Yeah. So who is going to read the text, but also my, my colleague and co-author Anne Johns uh, in California reminded me of this, not only the reader, but also the writer. Who are you as a writer? What is your role as mm -hmm. a writer in this text? And that's actually really fascinating because when if you take those four um, components, which I consider sort of the external components, uh, that text external, right? These yeah. are things going on around the text. Um, what what those um, four components uh, really require you to do is ask, okay, well, you know, not just what am I writing, but why am I writing it? And why am I the person writing this? Um, and I don't think that's something students often do, because usually the answer to that is so obvious. I am the student and I'm doing this for an assignment or for a grade. Or for, for a grade, exactly, yeah. Exactly, which is why I this, this issue of, of writing and I think the uh, narrowing of writing to the five paragraph essay is actually an issue of assessment um, and it's an issue of, of as I say the obsession with grading uh, I don't give you said you don't give grades for writing I don't give grades for anything uh, until the end of a, a course or semester I'm, I'm using principles of alternative assessment or ungrading um, mm -hmm. because it's I, I, it, it's absurd I used to teach courses where I had to, you know, we did three assignments, three completely different texts, and we had to average them. And, and what does that mean? You can't average yeah. three different types of texts. It's, it's, it's self-evidently absurd. But, but to get back to the, um, this idea of genre, um, what that forces you to do is think about, okay, who am I as a writer? Why am I writing? In what situation? And to whom? Because one of the problems with the five paragraph essay, which I think you alluded to earlier, you talked about having to send the reader away with a message. Not all yeah. writing sends the reader away with a message. In fact, not all writing has an argument. And, and the, the bit exactly. of the five paragraph essay, which drives me, the, uh, it seems silly, I think, but the part of it which annoys me the most is this idea of the thesis, uh, which is a completely, inv you know, the concept of a thesis is a rhetorical concept, but it only has meaning in argumentative writing. Mm. That's what it means. It's your argument. And yet I've seen endless textbooks and assignments and, and course materials and, and, and grading rubrics that talk about having a thesis for a personal narrative 
that's absurd. And even if you had one, you probably wouldn't state it directly and definitely not at the end of your first paragraph because then you've given away the whole text. I, I always yep. joke, if you're writing a, a detective novel, you don't end the first page by saying it was the butler in the kitchen with the knife. <laughs> Uh, unless you're, unless it's the, you know, the, the unless you're sort of writing, um, you know, if anyone remembers the old uh, American TV show Columbo, where they show you the oh, movie yeah. at the beginning, right? But that's fine. But then it's turning everything into that, and that's not how that genre usually works. And when you do that, you're deliberately playing with the conventions of the genre, and that's what mm. makes it interesting. But Start by thinking about who am I? Am I writing as an expert? Am I writing as a student? Am I writing as an impassioned citizen? Am I writing as a, an international student, as a multilingual, as um, someone who is knowledgeable about the topic or someone who is learning about the topic? Because that completely changes your approach to the entire task. So thinking about who you are as a writer, who the reader is, the context in which you're writing, and yes, absolutely, the purpose of doing this, what the writing is supposed to do, mm -hmm. what it is supposed to enact, is, is a really powerful way of getting into the process and sort of doing some of this planning and pre-writing and reflection before you you get to the text and it, it, it's something you can apply to text you 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 start by reading right you start by looking yep. at examples and analyzing how the writer might have come to those decisions themselves that's a transferable skill right that's a skill you can take and apply to your 10 page term paper or to yeah. writing a lesson plan or to writing a case study in a business class or a report for a professional context in in the workplace that those are skills which do transfer um, the idea that everything is written the same way doesn't and when it does it just causes problems because then you end up with writing which doesn't fulfill the purpose doesn't speak to the audience doesn't fit the context and tells me nothing about the writer's own persona and role. And it's just, it, it just becomes mechanical, you know, it, it just really becomes mechanical. Um, and and I, I mentioned that because that's what somebody told me, um, a, a subject lecturer when I was working in the UK, in England at the University of Kent, and I was also teaching on um, a program similar to the IEP, we call it the International Foundation Program. Uh -huh. And so we were teaching this, you know, format of writing with not five paragraphs, but longer, but every paragraph had a topic sentence and you had all your supporting details in between and you ended with a closing sentence. And the, the lecturer said to me, but we don't write like that. No. You know, it and, and I was work, young right? at the time. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I, I had my doubts. I, I, I knew, I, I, I know we don't write like that because I'm, I'm trying to um, get my literature review out. Um, I'm, I'm writing something and, you know, I've been getting my ideas together and I have to sit and write my literature review. And it's just flawed. Uh, and I find that every time I think to myself, Kanduk, now write a topic sentence. Now synthesize your information. Now, you know, finish your paragraph with a closing sentence. I just find that very difficult because yes, the ideas don't is. always flow that way. No, and it, it doesn't always fit uh, to, to, yes, if we could at least stop the, the, this idea of the concluding sentence, that would be great. I was just reading a student's paper last week, it's a graduate student. Um, and I, I, I said to her at one point, my feedback, I said, if you could please stop trying to write concluding sentences at the end of your paragraphs, that would really help because um, it was making them so repetitive and it was interrupting the flow of mm. ideas. I was actually getting lost uh, trying to follow um, uh, the, the idea. Um, but no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. We don't write that way. And the point that you're making about subject lecturers is really critical because we don't write the same way in every academic discipline. 
So yeah. even if the even if this so-called five paragraph essay taught argumentation, and I don't think it does, even if it did, what kind of argument is it teaching? And I think we've fallen into the trap of thinking there is one kind of argument. You know, if you open a lot of writing textbooks, it's the compare contrast essay, the argument essay, the mm -hmm. you know descriptive essay. I'd love someone to tell me what that is. I can't imagine. I've never really understood that. But there isn't one type of argument. The way we argue in history is not the way we argue in science. It's not the way we argue in literature or linguistics. Yeah. The very nature of argument is context dependent. It is part of the way knowledge is built and transmitted. And if you go into a philosophy class and write an argument for um, in the style of a biology paper, it will not be successful and vice versa. Not because you are quote unquote a bad writer or that it is bad writing, but it is writing that is being presented out of context and it is the wrong way of looking at it. So again, if we're thinking about what can we do in a writing class, because I don't, I don't take from this that we cannot teach writing. We obviously can teach writing. We know this because we, we do it all the time. We can teach writing and we can teach students to write even in fields that are outside our own experience if what we're teaching students is rhetorical flexibility. And mm -hmm. the five paragraph essay does the opposite. It's a rhetorical constraint. But when we teach flexibility, we teach students to analyze how are literature reviews written? How are these different texts written? And to be aware of the variety and the ways in which writing varies, then they can be prepared to tackle different tasks. If they only have one tool in their toolbox, that's what they're going to use. And, and that's going to make a mess. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that concept of teaching, reading and writing together, um, because you can only see also from authentic examples and, and in a lot of these writing textbooks um, that, that I've encountered, the examples are not always authentic. It's, it's a very rare case where, where I've seen an example that's, that's authentic. And the problem with that then is that if you want to introduce your students to an authentic example of a particular genre, that you as a teacher, you've got to do that preparation work in advance. Yes. Right? Yeah, and and not true. many people, not many teachers have the time or the space or perhaps even the knowledge of genres to do that. Yes, that, that, that's very true, although we do all have implicit knowledge of genre. So the example I, I often give uh, in workshops is I, I show, um, you know, I say when you, you, you pick up the post, pick up the mail and you've got a wedding invitation and the electricity bill, how do you know which is which? And you do, right? Nobody rips open the electricity bill wondering which of their friends is going to get married, right? You, you open <laughs> yeah. it to find out how much do I owe this month. And so we automatically, we very clearly have this implicit understanding of genre because, mm -hmm. we, you know, we live in these genres. These genres are how we structure our communication. You know, when you're listening to an academic lecture versus a stand-up comedy routine, right? Yeah. How, because of the person, the place, the context, but also the structure, the way that the... Uh, text is delivered, text, you know, viewed, viewed very broadly. So mm. I think people do recognize genre. Yeah, it, it is puzzling to me why so many textbooks um, present readings that are quote unquote authentic or authentic like. Um, and then in the writing, they have students do something which is entirely different from what they've read. As if to say, yeah. this is good writing, but we're not going to have you do that. We're going to have you do mediocre writing. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, everything has to have a thesis statement. Yeah, it's funny because the article you just had us read on Monday, teacher, didn't have one. <laughs> like, oh, no, but that's different. You're not to write that. You have to write this. And, I and have it's... been in that situation where I've come to class with an authentic piece of, you know, a research article of something, lit review, and we'd done that whole thesis statement, topic sentence, closing sentence. And... I have to admit, I wasn't properly prepared because I thought, yay, this is really good. And I brought it to class and we were looking for all these things. And of <laughs> course, my students were like, 
Yeah, um, can't find it, you know. So, ah, oh, that's so difficult. And I remember that was a long, long time ago when I first started teaching um, at university and teaching academic writing. And I was, I was in an English department. I was teaching all. I was all my students were English majors, and I was mm -hmm. looking. It was a time before we had um, academic writing textbooks available in Germany. So I knew about the five paragraph essay having taught the TOEFL and some colleagues said, yeah, just teach that. And then I was looking for authentic pieces of writing. So I went to the corpus from, you know, from Michigan, the, yeah. the written, the academic writing corpus and none of the writing samples had, first of all, five paragraphs. None of them had that format of, you know, exciting hook, thesis statement and right. and all that. And I was, I have to say, um, oh no, I can't think of the the English word at the moment. I felt very let down. I felt very yeah. let down by the system <laughs> because I wanted to do a good thing, but I couldn't do this good thing that I wanted to do, right? And now though, now I do it differently. I, I, I don't start with, with this um, format that has been, um, that has found its way into our curriculum. I start with authentic pieces of writing. It doesn't have to be, I don't always use um, academic pieces. Sometimes we have, um, I've done movie reviews from mm -hmm. newspapers and websites and things like that. I've done adverts and I ask students to look at it. And like you say, I ask them to look at it. I ask them to identify the genre. And then um, I ask them, okay, so, you know, you've got three examples of, of um, adverts for people buying and selling something. So it could be from eBay, from Facebook, from wherever. And I ask them to identify the family resemblances from that. And, and they enjoy that, right? They enjoy that. And then from there, I take them then to, to academic writing where we talk about, you know, what's the purpose? Who are the people who are writing this? And, and what do you see, you know? Um, mm -hmm how are these similar and and that gets more interesting um for students than just every week doing topic sentence five sentences for supporting details and a concluding sentence yes because that's not how anything is is truly written um yeah I, and that's what um christine tardy at the university of arizona calls genre genre awareness right mm. so there's it's one thing to teach genre knowledge which is how to write a particular genre and that's useful as well right so i'm, I'm yeah my, my class uh my, my uh, linguistics class has to write a, a teaching philosophy to a common text mm. submitted with job applications um, and i've read some really bad ones not from my students from job applicants uh, and they, you know, it really shows when, when people don't know what they're doing with it. It's a hard text. So obviously we're going to start by looking at examples and figuring out what is the purpose? How am I writing this? What am I trying to do with it? And what kinds of things do people who write these successfully um, actually do in it? And, and you, you go from there. Um, and so, you know, we're starting with looking at how the genre works in a particular context, that genre knowledge, genre awareness is being aware of genres when you encounter them so that you can successfully tackle new genres, ones you haven't been asked to do. Um, because what we find, certainly when we look at university writing uh, here in the States, and I think you, you mentioned something similar, the types of writing students do is actually quite varied. Mm -hmm. um, it's not all an essay it's not all a research paper and even when it is called a research paper each professor's expectations can be radically different from the next one and so yeah. something that would be a good research paper in one class you go down the corridor even within the same department the same um, uh, sort of academic field but to a different course a different module and the instructor has a different expectation such that, again, what you write in one class would be unsuccessful in another. And students who haven't got that flexibility don't mm. know how to deal with, or some students don't. Some students are able to handle that. And those yeah. are the students, I think, who get held up as the example and say, ah, look, the five paragraph essay works, they can transfer. No, these mm. are folks who maybe already had this 
understanding, this knowledge, this writing skill, but what about the others? What about the students who are struggling, who are pushing out these rote texts or are just giving up and saying, you know what, I, I can't do this, I'm going to have a computer generate it or get my friend to do it or plagiarise it. I, I think a lot of that comes from um, just a lack of confidence and not having the right set of skills to apply to the task. Um, yeah. So, you know, again, it all comes back to the question I think we've been talking about, which is, we, we need to know the purpose of the writing we're assigning. We need to know why we're having students do this, right? And, and mm. what they are, and they need to know that too. <laughs> we, yeah. It shouldn't be a secret. Yeah, I do a thing with my students um, when we talk about purpose and audience, what, what I get them to do in my class is I get them to come to class in one of the sessions with um, questions um, you know, for writing assignments that they've received from their subject lecturers. Um, and not only just from writing assignments, but um, exam short answer questions, that kind of thing. And, and they come in with that. And we look at the questions. And, you know, when I ask them, you know, why do you think you've been asked this question? They don't always know. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I ask them, you know, why do you think you've been asked to, to do this as a writing assignment? you know, at the top of their minds, they'll just go, oh, well, just to get a grade. But then when we look at it and we connect it, and, and this is something, again, that, that I've learned um, from you, is, is that we connect it to audience. Um, so I'm writing this not for you, Ms. Kutik, my lovely writing teacher, um, but I'm writing this for this person in this class that I've taken. So what does that person expect from me? And from there, right, I tell my students, you see, you can't just put the question into AI. You can't put the question into ChatGPT because ChatGPT will not know what you've been taught in that class. Your examiner has given you that question and wants an answer, wants your answer to reflect that you have understood the content of the course, you have worked with the material that, you know, you've all worked with in the course, and that needs to be reflected in your writing. And 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 for them, that's exactly. just, oh, wow, that's really, yeah. that's what they want from us? Yeah, and, and I think teaching students to sort of read the class, read the situation, um, and sort of uh, not just be, be passive uh, in the process, that is teaching them to be writers, ultimately. Mm. Um, and I, I think that is what we're trying to do. And not everyone's going to be a professional writer, and that's fine. And not even not everyone will be a great writer. That's fine as well. But at the end of the day, um, I think we're doing this because we believe students get something out of doing the writing. Uh, yeah. and out of the struggle and it's hard and i think a lot of it comes back to trying to make a task that is hard easy i don't think you can i think mm. you can support students i think you can give them feedback i think you can give them opportunities to improve i was listening on your newscast earlier this idea of you know first time every time is utter nonsense in writing who gets yeah. it right first time any time, never mind every time. Of course, nobody does. I've never published a first draft of anything. It takes me multiple drafts to get even close to something uh, publishable. Uh, and I'm sure this is true for everyone. Um, but if students are always working under the threat of the grade and the class and the assessment mm. and it has to be right and it has to be grammatically perfect or whatever it is, it has to have these formats, they're not really learning to write. They're just producing text. And yeah. I think I think it's more than that. And, and I hope that... Um, you know, by by approaching writing more flexibly, we can give students the confidence that they can approach writing tasks, they can engage with them meaningfully, and they can get something out of the experience because that's why we write. And, and just reminding ourselves 
that this is, you know, nobody write, nobody sits down and, and writes a five paragraph essay for fun or for profit or for anything else, <laughs> it, you know, and, and it's only done in a pedagogical context. Well, maybe let's rethink that and think about what we can do pedagogically that will be meaningful now, not in the future, but now, because that's what matters, right? Yeah, meaningful. And I think also to get, you know, engagement from students. I've had too many classes where they come in and like I said, I see it in their eyes. This is dull. This is boring, you know, but they enjoy talking about purpose. They enjoy talking about audience, not just for the sake of, of talking, but I, I find that when I introduce things like that to them, audience, purpose, um, context, right? So um, you could have one particular question. For example, you could have a question in, in a linguistics class, how do children learn languages? Okay, um, that could be a question in um, for my students in their TEFL class, how do children learn languages? Or it could be a question that they've been given in their general linguistics class, how do children learn languages? And in both those classes, they'd, be, they'd have worked with different material. The um, examiner or the lecturers expectations of what they produce will be different. And what I tell students is that they have to think about, like you said, who that examiner is, what that examiner's expectations are. And at the end of my course, I always tell my students, we won't have covered all the types of writing that that they'll need to do um, in the course of their studies or in the future. But what we have covered is um, the skills of, if you don't know, then have a look at an authentic example. I mean, I still do that. Like I said, I'm, 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 I'm writing this literature review and it's a big literature review. And, you know, I don't know how to do a big literature review. So I go back and see how other people have done it, how they've organized their literature review. And everyone is different. Everyone I've looked at is different. And for me then critically, I, I'll have to make decisions on, okay, you know, what format and, and how will I, on the basis of what I know, of what people do, how will I organize my information? And I think that's, that's an important takeaway in a writing class for students to learn that writing is a process and they'll always be learning how to write. Absolutely. It's a lifelong process. It's a lifelong skill. And we're all still learning. Well, Absolutely. Nigel, that's all for us from today. Thank you very much for your insights. Um, we could go on and talk about the five paragraph essay and automatic marking forever, but we've run out of time. It's been a pleasure having you with us. I hope you enjoyed us. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Very much so. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was a lot of fun. I, I hope uh, I hope that was useful. And uh, thanks for, uh, yeah, thanks for chatting. Yes, thank you very much, Nigel. And for all of you out there, there are teachers talk radio shows all week. So do join us or listen back on www.ttradio.org. Thank you, Nigel. Thank this you. show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use the code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.